In 2011, the most powerful earthquake in Japan's history occurred just off its eastern coast. Such was its seismic force. It actually shifted the earth from its axis by six and a half inches and caused a tsunami which flooded the Fukushima nuclear power station. What then followed was the worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl. The nuclear fuel in three of the reactors overheated and led to partial meltdown. An exclusion zone was created, expanding as radiation leaked from the plant, forcing 150,000 people to evacuate the area. Twelve years on, several towns remain off limits and that exclusion zone is still in place. But authorities there now have a new problem. What to do with the contaminated water used to cool those cores? They've been storing it in huge containers, which will soon reach capacity. So, the plan is to release that water gradually into the Pacific Ocean. Scientists say entirely safely, others aren't so sure. Well, let's take a look. Welcome to The Daily, I'm Neil Patterson. Helen Ann Smith is, of course, Sky's Asia correspondent. She joins us once again on The Daily. Good to see you, Helen Ann. Um, look, take us back to Fukushima 12 years ago. R remind us what exactly happened, because I was, I was at work that day and it was scary. It was very, very scary for a time. If you remember, a magnitude nine earthquake essentially struck just off the east coast of Japan. And, you know, that did enough damage by itself. But the real damage was caused by this absolutely huge, terrifying tsunami that just smashed into Japan's east coast, causing a huge, huge amount of damage to communities up and down the coast there. But particularly in terms of that Fukushima nuclear plant, what happened is that three of the four reactors there got flooded. They went into nuclear meltdown. They spewed radiation around a large area surrounding the plant. There was a very significant exclusion zone that was set up that has largely been in place for a long time, although it has got smaller over the years as the Japanese government have cleared up. And, you know, it's called the worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl, and it was very, very serious and very, very scary. But, of course, there's an awful lot of nuclear material, an awful lot of dangerous nuclear material in, in any nuclear power plant like this. So, so what have the Japanese done since then to kind of mitigate the risks, of, well, to, to stop? radioactive material getting into the ecosystem. If you put it in layman's terms, essentially the process of that kind of nuclear reactor melting not only meant it was seriously, seriously damaged, but there was actually lots of debris from the plant that was sort of scattered all over the place and very radioactive kind of nuclear fuel rods. They needed to be cooled down and sort of made less dangerous over a relatively long period of time. And as part of the process to do that, what is needed is huge, huge amounts of water. It's not something that they could just quickly do over a couple of months. It's something that they constantly have had to do over the last 12 years, you know, gradually you know, keeping that work up to continually decontaminate and cool down those damaged reactors. So as a result, this water that they've collected, it has just grown and grown and grown over the years. And they've known for many years, certainly the Japanese government and TEPCO, which is the name of the company that manages the site, they've known that at some point they were going to get to this stage where they were just going to run out of storage space. Worth saying as well that there was also leaks in the plant. So wow. on top of the water that's being used to cool the reactors, there's also groundwater and rainwater that leaks in. Every time that happens, that water also gets contaminated. That needs to be added to the pile of water that they don't really know what to do with. And it's all being kept at the moment in these massive tanks, thousands of huge steel tanks, which are essentially holding, you know, over a million metric tonnes of this contaminated water. Yeah, no, enough to fill 500 Olympic-sized swimming pools, as we always, always use a little analogy like that at, at times like this. So, so, so what is the plan? Because it sounds to me like this is material that has been stored for a reason. It has been stored because it is potentially dangerous. And is this the, the water that they're now wanting to release back into the oceans? It has gone through a rigorous treatment process at the TEPCO plant. And as part of that process, it's essentially filtered and around 60 plus odd kind of radioactive properties have been removed from that water. But there is one sort of key radioactive component uh, component that just can't 
completely be removed. And that's called tritium. So there are sort of trace levels of this radioactive component tritium still in that water. But crucially, it is important to say that tritium is a, a component that exists in, in all sorts of byproduct. The UN's nuclear watchdog, the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency, have said that the levels of tritium that exist within this Fukushima water is you know, quite significantly below the international standards and the international rules of where it should be to be safe. And lots of experts have chimed in saying that these levels are so low that they are well below uh, what you know, people radiation that people experience in everyday life, uh, just going about their sort of day to day business. Um, and, and when you add to that, it's also being released into a massive body of water, aka the ocean. We will come back to Helen Ann just a little later, but for now, let's dive into the science. Jim Smith is Professor of Environmental Studies at Portsmouth University. Jim, look, a lot to discuss about the release of the contaminated water, but before we do so, what is your assessment of how well that Fukushima site has been handled since 2011? Well, the Japanese have had a, an incredibly difficult job to manage the site. They've been storing this water since about 2012, so in the months after the accident, wastewater was discharged into the Pacific, but then then they started storing it um, and they've been storing it ever since. So what then has been the problem with this, this radioactive tritium? Why have they not been able to deal with that in the way in which they have a, a lot of the other problems with this yeah. wastewater? So tritium is a radioactive form of hydrogen. And what happens is that in, in a few molecules of water, instead of H2O, you get what we call HTO, which is one of the tritium radioactive form of hydrogen has replaced one of the hydrogen atoms in the water molecule. And that means that chemically and biologically, tritiated water behaves identically to ordinary water. And that means separating that small amount of tritiated water out of that 1.3 million tonnes of ordinary water is, is pretty much impossible at, at, at that scale. What concerns do people have about tritium itself? I understand we're going to deal in some depth with, with the science around this. We know that the IAEA are, are, are perfectly happy with, with this water being discharged. But, but tritium itself, radioactive tritium, what potential effects, harmful effects, might it have in sufficient quantities? So like all radioactive emissions or ones that we call what we call it ionizing radiation. And that means they can ionize molecules. In other words, they can knock electrons off molecules and change their chemistry. And in particular, they can damage DNA. So now we move on to the big question. How concerned should we be that the Japanese are, over, over an extended period of time, we have to say, they will be releasing this tritiated water into the oceans and some say potentially into the ecosystem? So they're going to discharge those 800 tanks over a period of 30 years. So it's going to be a very slow discharge. And we shouldn't be concerned. We shouldn't be concerned. Of course, we need to check it and check that they're doing what they say they're going to do. But what they're doing is, is something that happens at nuclear sites all around the world. So nuclear sites generate this tritiated water and they discharge it to, to rivers or lakes or, or the sea. And very often at much higher levels than this Fukushima release will be. So... So there's a, a nuclear site in, in China that, that emits about three times more tritium into the Pacific Ocean than Japan will from Fukushima. Our Sellafield site in the UK emits something like 40 times more each year into the Irish Sea of tritiated water. The La Hague site, a, a reprocessing site in northern France, emits 450 times more each year into the, into the English Channel. Yeah, this has been going on for decades, and the radiation doses, both to people and the environment, are really very low. The thing about tritiated water is that, I mean, if you have to emit radioactivity into, into the sea, then it's about the best thing to emit for two reasons. One is that the, the tritium radioactive decay is very weak. So although it can do DNA damage, you need an awful lot of it to do significant damage to create a significant risk. The other thing is that it doesn't bioaccumulate. So something like radioactive cesium, which was emitted at the time of the Fukushima accident, you would expect to get about 100 times more cesium in the fish than in the water. So you would get biomagnification. That doesn't happen with tritiated water because, and that's the reason it's in the waste in the first place, is because it behaves exactly like normal water. And so it gets diluted in the food chain by the huge, hugely 
bigger amount of, of ordinary water. So, Professor, those who are making claims about significant risk to the Pacific Ocean ecosystem, they are wide of the mark. I think they're incredibly wide of the mark. So for, just, to, just to give an idea of this, so, so the water is going to be reduced, treated until everything is below the Japanese guidelines and it's going to be diluted 100 times before it goes out the pipeline. So we measure radioactivity in, in a thing called a becquerel and there'll be 1,500 becquerels of, of tritium per litre of water discharge. And that probably sounds like quite a lot, but the World Health Organization drinking water limit for tritium is 10,000 becquerels per litre, so seven times higher. So in theory, you could drink this water. There have been dose assessments done, so, so people do models of where the radioactivity will go, how it accumulates in the food chain, how much people who consume a lot of seafood from that area could get, and they come out with really very, very low doses. Sure, but, but what then would you say to those who argue we should instead err on the side of caution, that putting zero tritiated water into the ocean is better than putting uh, some tritiated water in? I, I don't think that's erring on the side of caution. Mm. You could, in theory, you could keep building more tanks. So the, the Fukushima site's already full of tanks. You could keep building more. That would be very expensive, and, and money matters. You know, money that we don't spend on, on this can be spent on decommissioning the site. It can be spent on more important to me, environmental issues in the Pacific. So you could keep doing that, but it would lead to a risk of an uncontrolled release if one of the tanks leaked or there was a tsunami or, or earthquake. So I, I don't see why the Fukushima site shouldn't do what everybody else around the world, all the nuclear sites do, which is discharge into the ocean. For me, that's the environmentally the best option. I mean, there are big environmental issues in the Pacific that we should be worried about. Climate change is destroying the coral reefs of the Pacific and many other habitats. There's plastic pollution, there's both raw and treated sewage going into the Pacific, there's overfishing. There are real environmental problems and I think we should be focusing on those and not on what to me is, is, is not, a, not a significant problem. I, I wonder, Professor, your view on this, that p perhaps part of the problem here is that nuclear power, for some very obvious reasons, you know, has, has quite a negative press at the moment. Yeah. You know, when I was researching this story, my mind went immediately, well, not even to Chernobyl, but to that episode of The Simpsons where the nuclear power plant is yeah. depositing its waste and you see this little three-eyed fish jumping yeah. around in the background. I mean, is that part of the problem that whilst, you know, people will talk and make claims about the safety of, of nuclear power with, with, with empirical evidence there's still a lot of the public that are very, very nervous about it. Yeah, we worry about what to me is an insignificant release of radioactivity into the Pacific. And yet every day we, you know, we drive our cars and put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The risk to the environment and to people of nuclear actually is really low. And I say that having studied, uh, studied the Chernobyl accident for, for more than 30 years and having studied actually the cooling pond and looked at the fish, and we've got lots and lots of fish there, and we haven't found any that, that are deformed. At, at Chernobyl? Um, yeah, See, yeah, of course, yeah, they're, yeah. That is a surprising thing for me to hear, as I, I suspect it might be for, for, for plenty of people listening to this. Yeah, we studied the lakes around Chernobyl, so the cooling pond and some of the other really contaminated lakes, and we studied the aquatic invertebrates. We did find some subtle effects of radiation on, on uh, fish reproduction in one species, not in the other we studied. But in general, the fish health in indices were, were normal and the fish are thriving and there's a diverse fish population in those lakes. So those aquatic ecosystems are not being damaged and in fact probably benefiting from the absence of fishing in those lakes. Because, I mean, you couldn't eat the fish, but they're healthy. So, some reassurance there. In a moment, we'll be returning to Helen Ann to discuss the criticism of the plan, and it has been substantial. So you have the IAEA saying it's safe, you have the Japanese government saying it's safe. I'm just wondering what the, the, the reaction is like domestically in Japan, because look, you don't need to be an, an Asia expert like yourself to understand. You know, the Japanese have, have, have quite a strong seafood culture out there, sashimi, sushi and so on. I, I'm, I'm, I'm being slightly facetious, but I, I suspect that there will be a level of domestic concern, despite the scientific reassurance. The Japanese fisheries industry is enormously mm. important to it. The head of the Japanese fisheries put it 
in probably the most concise and easy to understand way just earlier this week when he met with uh, Prime Minister Kashida and he said scientific safety is not the same as the sense of safety and I think that really sums up just how worried and how impacted communities in Japan have been over this because you know even if the scientific reports say it's okay if your consumers are reading that there's radioactive water uh, and that the fish and the seafood you're buying are swimming around in this radiation, people just might choose not to buy. And that's already having an impact on the fishing communities on Japan's east coast and particularly around Fukushima. They are already talking about orders falling off. Remember, these communities and these people, they've already had their livelihoods completely decimated once about 12 years ago. And, you know, fishermen and people who run fishing pro fish processing plants and whatnot there say it took years for them to recover from that, not just because their buildings were wiped out by the tsunami, but because of that massive nuclear disaster and the radiation spill, it took a massive amount of time before people started buying fish and seafood from that area again. So, you know, these people are desperately worried. They are really angry. Um, and the Japanese government arguably uh, hasn't done enough as it, you know, hasn't done as much as it could have done uh, to reassure them and really engage them in this process. Yeah, I mean, I saw, saw one poll pa published in a Japanese newspaper suggesting 75% of those who responded said the government had not done enough to prevent the reputational damage to, to Japanese seafood. Uh, on that point, then, one has to presume the Japanese will be testing and testing madly uh, just as soon as they start releasing this water into the ocean. They've released all sorts of plans and details about how often they'll be testing. It won't just be testing the water. They'll also be testing the fish. Uh, they've actually invited the International Atomic Ener Energy Agency, which is the UN's nuclear watchdog, uh, to, to come and oversee part of that release. But there is an accusation that a lot of those efforts have come really quite late in this process and that that has caused a massive amount of distrust uh, to take China, for example, where I am. I mean, China absolutely has been the most vocal opponent uh, of this plan. It absolutely uh, rejects it and is, is deeply, deeply unhappy about it. And it's described Japan as using the ocean like its private sewer. And China's actually banned completely banned all imports of fish and seafood from 10 Japanese prefectures, including Fukushima and Tokyo. I mean, it's really pretty serious mm. economic measures uh, being taken. Um, Hong Kong's followed a pretty similar path. Worth saying Hong Kong is actually Japan's second largest market for its seafood after China. Certainly the people of South Korea have taken one of the most vocal approaches. There's been a series of pretty substantial protests. The government initially... Uh, saying it wasn't happy with the plan. It, it recently then said, having taken a very close look at the technical aspects, that it is happy with the technical and scientific aspects of the release plan, but it doesn't necessarily support it. Uh, a lot of the Pacific islands aren't happy about it. Mm. Uh, you know, and it really is, as I, again, as I said, these diplomatic efforts have come pretty late and a lot of the surrounding countries were not engaged in the process. Sure, sure. But, and I don't, I don't want to be churlish about this. I mean, I'm, I, I can only imagine how it would feel if I were living five miles down the coast from Fukushima. Um, but given the science is where it is, given what we have heard from the IAEA and others, I just wonder whether there might might just be a political, a geopolitical element to the opposition that we are seeing uh, to what Japan is doing from China and, of course, Chinese-controlled Hong Kong. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely fair to say. And, of course, China and Japan have a long, complicated and difficult history between them. There's a lot of animosity. There is a definite question on sort of what exact scientific grounds China is opposing this. Worth saying China also has a consistent track record, particularly in recent years, of doing everything it can to promote its domestic industries, in this case, arguably, its domestic fisheries. So I think there is definitely a degree of political opportunism from the Chinese, perhaps mixed with some legitimate concern. OK, here's, here's the thing, Helena. In, in 10 years' time, are we not going to be back in exactly the same position once these tanks fill up again? I mean, do the Japanese actually have a plan long term for dealing with this plant, for dealing with those fuel rods, so we don't have to find ourselves back in exactly the same situation? I think that's a very good question. And even uh, on the current plan with the current water that we're talking about, uh, we are talking about decades 
of release of this water. This is not a thing that's going to be over in the next couple of months. This oh. is a long uh, considered process and one, yes, that, that will probably dominate uh, for many years to come. And you know, there is a plan to decommission the Fukushima uh, nuclear plant, but the extent of the damage that was done at that process is not quick and it is not easy. Regardless of the fact, again, that all the experts say that this is safe, uh, it will go on for a very, very long time. And that's your lot for this episode of The Daily. We'll see you next time.